Hi, this is Erin and welcome to Everything EFL. If you're wondering where Shane is, catch our last episode. So I'm back this week with the dazzlingly positive Erin Myers of the Educators Mindset podcast. How are you? I'm great. Happy to be back again. <laughs> Good. How's the weather in San Diego? Oh, you know, it's starting to cool down a little bit. So I'm really grateful for that. And, and cool down is like 60 degrees. So it's, I know it's not that cold, but I'm, I'll take anything oh. I can get. <laughs> You don't know the meaning of the word cold. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I totally know that. <laughs> you don't want to, trust me. Okay, so last week uh, we had so much fun. I thought I'd invite you back for another episode. Uh, you gave some really good tips last week about using Zoom. So I thought that this week we could explore the topic of online learning and you could give some tips, not necessarily technical ones, but how to engage students mm -hmm. and build relationships. Because I think this just like looking around on Instagram, I think this is something that um, some teachers are struggling with. So yeah. um, can we start by taking us through like your first 10 minutes of class? So what are the typical issues and i imagine now you've you're experienced enough to overcome them to a certain degree to a certain degree yes i mean i think with online learning there are always possibilities of something going wrong or different than you mm -hmm. had planned um flexibility is key and i think that when i think of the first 10 minutes of my class that's really the time that i use to connect with my students and so with online learning it could take a couple seconds to a couple minutes for students to log in. So I recommend for teachers to have like a five to 10 minute activity where it's just community building because it allows time for students to get logged in and get set up. So for my class, what I like to do, and I actually just gave my students a survey and they like it too. So highly recommend not myself, but also my students. Um, what I do is I have an agenda slide up displayed for students as they're entering. I have my video on, but my microphone's off because as they're entering, I'm actually taking attendance. On the agenda slide, it has what we're doing for the day. Um, it's really helpful for students who might have anxiety of unknown classes and what to expect. So that really helps. Um, the learning objectives for the class. I have a timer that counts down so they know when class will start. And I also that's have an, nice. yeah, that, that's really helpful. Um, and then I also have an attendance question that's really fun. Um, it's not necessarily related to our language and literature class, but just a great way to get to know students. For example? For example, the other day I asked students, and this ranges and it builds as, as I get to know them better. So I'll start off with simple things of, do you prefer TV shows or movies? And okay. they'll, they'll write in the chat, TV shows or movies. I just ask them to answer the, sim the question simply um, to get that engagement going. And then what I'll do is I actually have popsicle sticks, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this show. Um, but I pull students' names and I do two, I call them voluntolds, where I tell them they have to share, <laughs> um, and then two volunteers. And so I'll pick a popsicle stick, ask them to share what they wrote, and then explain why. So elaborate on their answer. Um, okay. It's a great way to get students to get to know each other as well. And if students are a little stuck, I'll let them pass for the moment and I'll have a couple other students share and then I'll go back to the original student and say, okay, you heard some other ideas. What do you think? So, okay. Yeah. Do they ever get to, cause there could be quite an awkward age there. Do they ever get to the point where you could stick them in a breakout room to discuss the question together or does that just not really work? Oh, a hundred percent. And I think, I think it just depends on the types of questions you ask. If you're asking more academic questions, that might take a little bit of time for them to build comfortableness and, and get comfortable with that. But if you're having them answer fun questions, like who's your favorite historical figure or you yeah. know, do you prefer TV shows or movies? Do you like sweet candy or sour candy? If you keep it light, they want to talk about those kinds of things. Yeah. And it's all um, building common ground and mm -hmm. getting to know each other and stuff. So there, it's really nice. It's really nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, but do you, are there any other problems that like maybe you didn't anticipate at the start, but you anticipate now as part of the planning? Yes. Um, a couple of things. I mean, there are awkward silences. So I, you know, it's, sometimes you just have to embrace the awkwardness and I call it out. Like I'll actually say this is an awkward silence and it'll get students to laugh. So, you know, just it's a nice collocation as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, also, you know, there was an expectation that students were to have their videos on all the time. However, 
that causes a lot of glitching and lagging for a lot of students because they are often at home with other siblings who are trying to get on the Wi-Fi as well. So okay. having new approaches and not necessarily requiring cameras to be on all the time, but having fun ways to check in with students to make sure they're still there too, because it can be really easy to get distracted online. You know, they'll open up YouTube or, the, you know, yeah, things like course. that. <laughs> <laughs> I so, probably would. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how do you do that? How do you sort of make sure they're still there if the video isn't on? Yeah, well, I think it's really important to have some connection and have different parts of the lesson where you at least check in and see their cameras because we're human beings. We want to interact with people. Um, and you and I, for example, it's so wonderful, but I know that we would be able to do so much more if we were actually together in Ireland or in San Diego. And so what I do is when students come in, I ask them to turn on their camera just so I can wave good morning to them and then they turn it off. And then I'll do random check-ins too, just to make sure they're still there. So I'll say, okay, we're going to take a five minute break and then you're going to come back and we're going to turn cameras on. And so it's just a quick okay. check-in and they all turn them on, wave to each other, and then they can turn them off. My most important um, thing that I do is at the end of class, they have to turn on their cameras to be dismissed because then I can say their names one by one, wave to them, wish them a good day and things like that. It's not only helpful, but it helps build that community as well. Oh, that's so nice. And I think also turning off the videos gives them a bit of breathing room and you a bit of yes. breathing room as well. I'd mm -hmm. imagine because it's, uh, it's, um, from what I've heard, it's very, very intense teaching online. It, it just, um, it definitely takes some navigating through. Um, there's going to be different things. I actually always keep my camera on if I can, but if a student tells me that their computer is lagging and every other camera is off, but mine's the only one that's on, I'll turn mine off too. Um, but okay. it, you know, it is, we, as teachers, we always, we feel like we always have to be on. Um, so yeah. getting a little bit of a camera break can be really helpful. And just showing the students, hey, I'm gonna take a quick break, but I also know when it, I need to come back and be prepared, so. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So how about like middle school, I imagine can be quite an awkward age in terms of students talking to each other or maybe having a bit of fear or embarrassment of, of, of speaking English out loud to you. Mm -hmm. um, and just basically just the age where it might be difficult to engage them. So I, th I think this is a bit of a two part question, but how, what strategies do you use to engage your students to make sure they're interested in, in what you're doing? And then how do you then get them to actually talk and produce language? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think there are a lot of different things that you can do. For me personally, being a language and literature teacher, you know, as we've talked about before, it's really getting them to use the language. So what I'll often do is if we're having a discussion, for example, the other day, uh, my seventh graders and I were talking about Colin Kaepernick, who uh, was a former NFL football player who took a knee and it was this whole thing a couple years ago. So the students actually read a couple of articles um, about this and just some of the things that happened after the fact. And to prepare for the discussion, I actually put them on a Jamboard, which I mentioned in our last episode together, um, where they could just put virtual sticky notes of their thoughts and just kind of get an idea down of what they thought about these articles, about the situation. Uh, we really focused on uh, individuals' actions and then the reactions to those actions. Um, mm. I, think, I think doing that ahead of time where they can see a collaborative board where they're seeing all these ideas empowers them because if they're stuck a little bit in the beginning, I'm not sure where to start, they can at least see some examples and then get their thoughts going. Um, okay, that's So nice. we've done that and then we'll go into discussion groups. And in the last episode, I mentioned how I do different breakout rooms. So if a student yeah. still needs more support, they might stay in the main room with me. If they're in the second breakout room, they might be talking with a partner with their videos and their microphones on. Um, you had mentioned, you know, they might get a little camera shy. So I, I'll have another breakout room where um, it's for students who just want to communicate through the chat. So just giving them different options to communicate, I think is really, really important and not forcing them to communicate with their microphones and cameras on at the very beginning, but kind of easing them into it. Mm. I saw today actually there's um, a lady on Instagram and her mm. Instagram handle is writing up and down. Do you know her? I don't. Writing I up don't. and down. Um, she had like a four slide post and one of the things she put on was like a screenshot of her lesson and she had mm -hmm. like how to ask questions and she had a little thing where they can either ask her directly or they can write so she gives them the two options so mm -hmm. that sounds kind of similar to what you're doing but I just think that's a really nice idea like give them the choice 
yeah build their confidence a bit I think that's really important especially at that age you know yeah for example I had a student um at the beginning he he talks to me now but in the beginning he actually would use a voice translator where he would type what he wanted and then just play it and it would say it out loud I I don't know if he thought that I would would not be able to tell the difference between like a very robotic voice versus his (laughs) but you know I didn't push him on it either I didn't you know it's like he's trying to communicate and now he you know, he unmutes himself and asks questions all the time. So I think it's just meeting the kids where they're at and giving them the stepping, you know, stepping tools to get to where you want them to be. Yeah, a bit of time and space. I, I think confidence building is is huge. And I think maybe that's something people or m- some teachers may underestimate. And it might be very easy to, go, to, think, to think, oh, maybe they're being a bit lazy or they can't be bothered. But maybe it is just a case of they're shy or they just they don't have any confidence. Mm-hmm. You know? or even mm-hmm. even being virtual sometimes the the kids computers freeze and so we might yeah. as teachers think oh they're just not participating but on their end they're trying so hard to communicate but they can't um and that's yeah. something that I had to learn too you know I uh, it's been my motto this year is just assume the best and if the students are having you know not communicating there's a reason for it they're not just trying to not communicate or participate you know um so yeah. Nice. It's a lovely attitude. So this kind of leads into, because I think this, what you've just spoken about and building relationships with students is kind of connected. So what are your top tips for building those relationships with your students? I mean, I think one of the most important things is, is using your students' names. Um, I think virtually, even with my attendance, sometimes I can just take attendance and they're coming into the Zoom and I'm not saying good morning because I'm so busy taking attendance and I think just acknowledging that the kids are there and using their names is like the most important thing you can do. Um, What I also like to do is I actually have new students on Monday because we're on a quarter system so I'll have new students and what I'll have them do is uh, record a video uh, just to share with me telling me about themselves and then I'll ask them how to pronounce their names because students have very unique pronunciations sometimes like for example you could have Andrea, Andrea, on, like Andrea yeah. you know all these different pronunciations um, and then what I'll do is I, I mentioned the popsicle sticks I'll write their name the pronunciation and then I'll actually write a few notes about them so when the, we are doing the attendance question or they might be working on something, I'll send them a private message through Zoom and say, hey, how are you today? How's your brother doing? If they mentioned a brother and they're going oh, to nice. Uh, you know, hey, you mentioned that you really like um, soccer. Are you able to play soccer right now? Um, so just doing those little check-ins. I try to connect with the kids at least once a week through private messaging on Zoom just to check in with them. You'd make a great hairdresser if you wanted to change your <laughs> careers. <laughs> Thanks, thanks. Uh, um okay so um again just sort of having a look on instagram and stuff mm-hmm. um some teachers are quite stressed um I, i'm sure there's a million reasons for that but do you have any tips sort of just to to reduce or take away some of that stress and where do you think a lot of that stress comes from as well ah well i think i think uh First of all, with just everything that's been going on and just the climate of government and things, especially in the U.S., there's been there's been so many high and low points for teachers. And I am, I'm assuming this is around the world as well, where, you know, when the pandemic first happened, teachers were looked at as heroes because we quickly adjusted, yeah. we were able to do all these things. And then all of a sudden, once, you know, the new school year started, now teachers are not necessarily the greatest because they don't want to go back to school because it's not safe. And now we're these terrible people that only care about ourselves. And so I think some of that stress and pressure comes from outside. I also Mm. think we put a lot of it on ourselves because we know that we're responsible for, you know, 10, 20, 30, up to hundreds of students, you know, academics. And so I think a lot of that comes from that. And my biggest piece of advice is less is more. I think for me, this was something that I struggled with when we first went virtual. I was trying to make it exactly like we were still in the classroom. And that is so challenging. And when I Mm. say this, it's not lowering our expectations, but thinking, okay, how can I dive deeper with this curriculum and not go so broad? Because, you know, the kids are navigating through new curriculum at a grade level and also learning virtually without having the socialization they're used to with their peers. They don't have those breaks that they used to at school, recess or lunch or whatever it might mean or it might be. And so less is more, you know, go deeper with your content, 
if you're going to read a text, don't just take two days to read it and analyze it. Take a whole week to and do different things with it. Um, it's going to take away a lot of the stress on ourselves because we're not having to prepare as much. And the kids are also going to be able to do better with it because they're going to get, you know, review, repetition, and they're really going to be able to master those skills. So as a teacher, I think yeah. it's down to like, do you want your kids to kind of know 10 standards or 20 standards, or do you really want them to have a solid understanding of five to seven? Right. Yeah. And so that would be and I think advice. also if you're if you're using the same material, you get a chance to flex your creative muscles a little bit. Yes. What can I do? How can I exploit this text? You can go into it linguistically. I mean, there's yes. so many things you can do with a text or a video. Like a hundred percent. And I know we were talking yeah. about that in the last episode too. So you know, you could take a music video, you could do vocabulary with it, and then you could have them, you know, do uh, create a story for it, and all these things. Like you said, I think it's a great way to increase that creativity too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what about like you, you, you sort of mentioned very briefly the materials you use. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've really answered this or not now at this point, <laughs> but um, adapting course book material. Do you use like a curriculum tech? What do you use? So with our district, we do have an online workbook that students can use. Um, okay. I, work, I work at a specific school where we're an international baccalaureate school. So we have a little bit different approach to it. But Bottom line, if you're virtual teaching, find programs that are already made that you can make your own and tweak it and adjust it. So for example, there are companies called like New ZLA who have tons of um, nonfiction articles, differentiated levels, questions that go with it. So you can take those things um, and, and have it already online for the kids. And then like you said, flex your creative muscle and do more with it. Um, you know, so New ZLA or Common Lit are two websites that are free um, and they offer really great, you know, practices, information, leveled texts, all those kinds of things. Yeah. I think also um, for teachers in private language schools, um, I think the Guardian Online, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure does um, English lesson um, articles with questions and stuff like that. Yeah. So I'll put all those links on the show notes. Um, so if you're listening, don't panic. It'll all be there. <laughs> um, and we were chatting a little bit briefly last week about waiting time. Do you want to just yeah. go into that? Yeah, I think, and you know, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier too, is, yeah, you know, waiting time, I think, especially when you're a new teacher, when you're standing in front of the classroom, you know, you might, seconds feel like hours, right? Yeah. We always feel like we want to fill in any fill those silences. awkward silences, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's, it's, we're all learning. For example, I was just observed the other day by my assistant principal. She timed my wait time and she's like, okay, some of your wait times were only about 20 seconds and that's so fast, right? So as me as an educator, I have to think, okay, how can I give more wait time? Because again, with virtual, it could be computers lagging, students just need mm. think time. Um, so I actually set a, a, an alarm on my watch now for, you know, a minute or two minutes, depending on the question so that it's, it really forces me to give more wait time because, you know, seconds can feel like minutes or hours even. And we do need to give students that processing time. Yeah. I mean, I've been teaching for a long time, but I can say I'm, I'm definitely guilty of probably not giving students enough wait time because like you say, those, it just, it's excruciating sometimes if there's a 30 <laughs> second silence and you're just right. like, come on, speak. You know? Right. So I do try to give at least 60 seconds. And if they're still not engaging, I'll say, I'll ask them, do you need more thinking time? Or would you like me to go to someone else and come back? Um, yeah. You know, never letting them off the hook because we need to get that, that engagement and that participation patient. Um, but sometimes, you know, they just get a little nervous. So giving them a little bit of wait time and then, you know, do you need more thinking time or do you, do yeah. you need to go to someone else and come back? So, and also they're not always keen on asking for help or saying, I don't know, yes. you know, so sometimes yeah. you, at the end you sort of need to go, do you, do you need a hand or do you want somebody else to answer the question or something right. like that? But, and even, yeah. and even doing that, sometimes the students still won't ask for help, but you do as yeah. much as you can as a teacher, right? You can't do everything. You can't force a kid to ask a question, yeah. um, but you can just encourage them and, and remind them that you're there for them. <laughs> Could they, um, do you have a capability that allows them to message you? Like if they don't want to say it, 
they can message you and go, I don't know, or don't yes. want to answer this question. Yeah. Yeah. So the nice thing is, is with Zoom and Google Meet, there, there is a chat feature. I know with Zoom, um, they can send private messages as well. And then we also use Google Classroom, which I mentioned in the last episode, and we can private comment there as well. So if they're working on assignment on their own, if they have a question, they can actually leave a comment and it will pop up in my email and notify, and notify me. So um, okay. it's definitely a lot, a uh, lot of yeah. help. So it seems like there are lots of different ways for you and the, the student to communicate with each other, maybe even more so online, because you can't really, you don't really have that private function in a classroom, you know, like 100%. some students will just sit there like in silence, not answering the question, not knowing how to answer the question, not being able to say, I don't know, but with, mm -hmm. with the virtual, you can, they can just type at you, which is really nice. Yeah. hundred percent. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because I have gotten more students that ask for help because they know it's in the privacy of just them and me instead of in class, raising their hand and asking. How could you continue that when you go back into the classroom? Or do you think you will have established enough trust by that point? I think what, what I'll do is, I mean, I hope that students, you know, feel open to, to ask those questions, but I think what I'll have is actually just a running document where they can ask questions um, and I can answer on that document just back and forth. So yeah. I think just giving them that option, I know we've talked about, you know, sometimes just speaking, they get a little tongue tied or they're not sure. So giving them a, a way to write as well and express questions or um, things that they might need help with. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, last question. Do, have you done anything um, that's just bombed? <laughs> have, what have you learned from it? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, <laughs> and I don't think, I don't, if any teacher said they've they've never tried something that bombed, they're lying. Because come they're on, lying. you know they're Absolutely. lying. Absolutely, they're lying. And I think <laughs> you know you've mentioned Instagram, and I think you know with this pandemic, I think a lot of teachers just want to be positive, and they don't necessarily share the things that have bombed. But trust me, it happens. Oh, uh, yeah. For example, um, I handed out, I was able to go to school and actually hand out copies of reading books to students. And I had this whole plan in my mind of, oh, we're going to do reading groups and it's going to be great. They're going to be able to go to breakout rooms and read. That bombed because some students didn't read at all. Some students read on pace, some students read ahead. And so when they were getting in the breakout rooms, it was like they didn't know where to start reading together because they just didn't have that self-management yet. I kind of threw yeah. it at them pretty early. Um, so that definitely bombed. I ended up having to not have them read together. And I actually used a, a program called Flipgrid, which is also free. It's video recording. Um, and so instead of them getting into breakout rooms to read, they would read on their own and then record videos and comment on each other's videos in their group. So they still collaborated, but it wasn't that, you know, that they were getting in a breakout room and then one student was on page 100 and the other was on page five. Like, where do you start? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely it's, bombed. <laughs> it's, but the great thing about that is like you, you can reflect and learn, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't mind when things go wrong in, in class because you've got to take, a good teacher takes risks, tries new things, and if it bombs one, it could just be the class itself. Maybe it mm -hmm. just didn't work with this particular class, mm -hmm. or maybe you just got it completely wrong, but this is how I'll do it next time. So it's all yeah. good. It's all good. Yeah. You know? and, and the last thing is learning. I, yeah. And the last thing I'll say on that is what's, what was really helpful. And I should have mentioned it earlier, but whenever you're starting a class with students, I highly recommend creating an essential agreement and you essentially ask students how do you like to be shown respect? How do you show respect to others? What do you value? How's that going to show up in our class? Because for example, with that bombing of the reading groups, you know, students were not staying, uh, were not staying on track. And so I was able to revisit the essential agreement with them and say, Hey, you know, you said, you told me that you valued this, this, and this, and yet we're not seeing that in reading groups. So how can we adjust and making it more of a learning opportunity and being, being transparent, with the kids in a, in, you know, to a certain degree of things that didn't go well. Like I told them, Hey, the reading groups are not going very well. I realize that. I know you see that. Let's think about what we can do to make it better. Um, you know, oh, that's nice. Incorporating the them into the reflection is really nice as well. Yeah. That's 100%. really nice. Um, so you mentioned, um, in our conversation last week, some free programs. Now this isn't going to apply to everybody listening, but if you're teaching in a in a state school like Erin, you mentioned some free programs to communicate with parents. Yeah. You talk yeah. about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the program that I use is called Class Dojo. Um, it's a website and there's an app for it. Oh, yeah. And essentially, uh, Class Dojo, you can 
What I like about it is there's so many different features in it. There's an attendance where parents can see virtually. A lot of parents are working, so they don't know if their, their student is showing up for virtual meets, but they can get that instant access. If they see I marked an absent, That's they can nice. follow up. Um, there are randomizer tools and things like that. There's music on there that you can play for students. But my favorite part about it, uh, two things. One is you can direct message parents. You can get them hooked up to Class Dojo and the parents can set up what language they want to receive messages in. So I have a lot of parents uh -huh. who speak Spanish as their first language. So I can send out messages and it automatically will translate into Spanish for them, which is awesome. And vice versa. That's amazing. So if they write me, it'll translate to English for me. Which is pff, so That's good. Brilliant. That's yeah. really, really good. Yeah. That's great. And then wow. the, uh, the other thing that I really love is with Class Dojo, um, and this ties into the essential agreement too, is students, you can use it for participation. So you can do positive participation points or you can do negative points if you choose. I know some teachers don't like doing negative points. For our essential agreement, I ask students, hey, what do you want to earn? Like, what do you want to work towards? And then do you want to have points taken away for certain behaviors? And all my students this past quarter, they all wanted to have points for, you know, if you were late and didn't tell the teacher why you were late, you'd lose a point um, or different things like that. And then, you know, they earn points for participating in the chat or having their video on or doing these things. And the nice thing is, is whenever you give points or you take away points on the app, you can actually put a little note, which will send it to parents. So parents can see the points their kids have earned. They can see the points their kids have lost mm -hmm. and they get um, a notice as to why. So if I took away a point, it could say, um, didn't turn in work, you know, for the day or whatever it might be. That's really nice. It kind of takes a bit of the pressure off of you um, mm -hmm. involving the parent. They have to be accountable to them as well, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Lovely. We'll stick all of those links on the show notes, guys. Yeah. Um, would you like to plug your pod and tell us oh. where we can find you on social media? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much again. And if anyone's listening and they are virtual teaching right now, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm here just sharing what I've learned over the past couple months. I'm by no means an expert, but I'm sharing what I know, right? So you can find me on Instagram, um, Aaron Myers uh, with a dot in between. So Aaron.Myers. Um, and I also have a podcast called the Educators Mindset Podcast, which I've been so blessed to have you, Aaron, on my podcast as well. Um, and so I just think, you know, us teachers always have to stick together and especially through the pandemic, you know, sharing all Absolutely. that we can. <laughs> And you've shared some really, really nice tips today. I'm, I'm really happy I did this episode. I've been wanting to do something like this for a while because, like I said, I don't know. So, you know, it's nice to have someone who has some really nice ideas, really, like, just engaging ideas. Like, it's so important to, you know, build those relationships with your students and stuff. So thank you once again. Mm -hmm. um, and please like, share and follow everything EFL on Instagram, Facebook or Twitter. Find the link to the podcast on our social media bios and listen on Spotify, Anchor, wherever. And don't forget to tell your colleagues, share the love. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>